This is a principle historians use when they're trying to figure out whether a historical writing is telling the truth. It goes like this. If there's something embarrassing to the author or authors, it's probably true. Why? Because you're not going to make that up. You're not going to make up things that make yourself look bad, right? You're only going to have, if you're making up a story, you're going to have things in there that make you look good. Turns out the New Testament, and by the way, so is the Old Testament, but let's just look at the New Testament now. The New Testament's filled with embarrassing details about the authors. For example, the New Testament writers depict themselves as dim-witted. You notice that? They're dim-witted. They fail to understand what Jesus is talking about on several occasions. Despite being taught several times, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to go, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise from the dead. What? We don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> they are uncaring. They fall asleep on Jesus not once but twice in his greatest hour of need. They make no effort to give Jesus a proper burial. Who buries Jesus? Joseph of Arimathea. Who was Joseph? Well, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. What did the Sanhedrin do? The Sanhedrin actually sentenced Jesus to die. So wait a minute. The New Testament writers are saying that they kind of ran away, and then Joseph, remember the Sanhedrin, came and buried Jesus and put him in a Jewish tomb. Now, why would they make that up? They look bad. He looks good. Jesus is put in a Jewish tomb. That's the last place they'd put him if they were making up this story, right? Because the Jews would have gone to their tomb and said, no, uh, no, here's his body, right? If he was in their tomb, or if he wasn't buried in their tomb, they would have said, he wasn't buried in the tomb. But you know what they wound up saying? Oh, the disciples uh, came and stole the body while the guards were asleep. Well, that's a pretty stupid excuse, isn't it? Number one, if a guard, Roman guard, fell asleep on watch, what would happen to him? <laughs> Off with your head. Secondly, if you're asleep, how do you know what happened? <laughs> you ever think about that? I was asleep. And stayed asleep while they come and stole away the gar stole away the body. Okay. <laughs> they are rebuked. Peter's called Satan by Jesus. You think they made that up? You think Mark was making up the story and he said, Yo, Pete, I'm gonna have the Lord call you Satan. What do you say? <laughs> Paul rebukes Peter for being wrong about a theological issue. Peter is trying to teach that the New Testament believers have to obey the Old Testament law. You know what Paul says? He comes in Galatians and says, I told Peter to his face that he was wrong for trying to get these new believers to obey the Old Testament law. Now Peter is supposed to be the first pope. I know papal infallibility didn't come to much later, but why would Paul tell Peter that he's wrong? And why would they put that in the scriptures if they're making up a story? If you're making up a story, if you're making up a new religion, you don't have these problems. Everything's fine, right? Turns out if you look at the New Testament epistles, the letters, most of them are about problems. First Corinthians, what's the problem? Sexual immorality, Paul writes a letter. Second Corinthians, they don't think Paul's an apostle. What does Paul do? He writes in a letter. Galatians, legalism, what does Paul do? Writes a letter. Colossians, what's the problem? All sorts of heresies. Paul writes a letter. Suffering throughout the ancient world, what does Peter do? He writes first Peter. Now, if they're making up a new religion, making up a story, they don't have these problems, do they? But the problems are throughout the New Testament church. Why? Because that's really what was going on. Right? The other interesting part, point about this is you notice that all the problems they were experiencing back then are the same problems we're experiencing today. We still got sexual immorality. We still got all sorts of heresies running around out there. We still have people suffering. That's why this book is still relevant. We're still dealing with the same problems. If they were making this up, they wouldn't have those problems. Also, they are cowards. Peter denies Christ three times after saying he wouldn't. And then the disciples run away. This is like a Monty Python movie. <laughs> run away! Ah! And who are the brave ones? Ladies? The women! That's right. I am woman, hear me roar. I didn't run away like you sissy pants men did. 
Now who wrote this down? Men. Now what man? Is going to write down that he was hiding for fear of the Jews while the women went down and discovered the empty tomb. Nobody. But all the men say that, don't they? Now, if I was making this up, if I was a man making this up, here's how I'd write it down. I'd say, uh, we marched right down there and moved that sissy Roman guard out of the way. <laughs> then we saw Jesus who congratulated us on our great faith. And then we went and comforted the trembling women. <laughs> right? They are doubters. Despite being taught several times that Jesus would rise from the dead, they're doubters after they hear about him rising. Not only are they doubters after they hear about him rising, they're even doubtful after they see him. See this verse, Matthew 22, or Matthew 28, 17. That's two verses before the Great Commission, the end of the book of Matthew, when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? That's two verses before it. And yet they're saying that some were doubting. They're standing there looking at the risen Jesus and they're going, oh man, I don't think that's Jesus. You think that's Jesus? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, that's Jesus. I can't be Jesus. He was dead. I saw him crucified. He was in the tomb. He couldn't be Jesus. I'm telling you, man, it's Jesus. It can't be Jesus. How do you know it's Jesus? Uh, the women told me. <laughs> okay. Not only are there embarrassing details about themselves, there are embarrassing details about Jesus that they, they never would have made up if they were making up a new religion and had Jesus as being God. Because Jesus is considered out of his mind by his own family who come to take him home. He's deserted by many of his followers. He's not believed in by his own brothers. He's thought to be a deceiver. He turns off Jewish believers to the point that they want to stone him. Remember when he says, before Abraham was born... I am, and they pick up stones to stone him. Why? Because he was claiming to be the I am of the Old Testament. Do you remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? <laughs> and Charlton said, who can I say who's asking me to do this? And he said, I am. I am meaning what? The self existent eternal one the one with no beginning and no end Jesus was saying that's me in my divine nature that's me and they went they picked up stones to stone him he's called a madman he's called a drunkard he's called demon possessed he has his feet wiped with the hair of a prostitute which easily could have been seen as a sexual advance and he's crucified despite the fact that being hung on a tree was to be under God's curse according to the Jews. If you were making up a story or a new religion about a Messiah for the Jews, you'd never have the guy hung on a tree. Why? Because he's under God's curse. Jesus was under God's curse in a way. In fact, there's only one place Mel Gibson shows up in the uh, Passion. Where does he show up? His hands are nailing Jesus to the cross. Why? He said, because I helped put him up there. That's right. Jesus was under God's curse, the curse of sin that we have put upon ourselves. And he took it away because he loves us. And he loved us even though we were sinners.